Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this afternoon's session of PyCon 2019. Our first speaker in this block is Haley Denbraver, and she will speaking, she'll be speaking to us about engineering ethics and open source software. Please make her feel welcome. Can you all hear me? Okay, perfect, thank you. Well, hello, thank you, and just thank you so much for joining me today. We are gonna talk about engineering ethics and open source software, and I'm really glad you weren't put off by that title and that you're here, so thank you so much. So welcome, let's get started. My name is Haley Dunbraver, and you can tweet at me at this Twitter handle that you find on the screen. I work at Sneak as a developer advocate. Sneak builds tools to help developers use open source as securely as possible. And because we eat, breathe, and sleep security, our logo is this intimidating Doberman dog. But in my role as a developer advocate, I try to be more like this golden retriever. Friendly, approachable, helpful, and eager to talk to you about open source security. So please don't hesitate to reach out if you want to chat. Last year, I was at a number of conferences and shared a talk about engineering ethics. And this talk was based on my experience as a licensed civil engineer, because that's what I was in a past life. This is a picture of my favorite project, which is a hotel near Disneyland. And there was a lot to that talk, but the TLDR was that we need to take responsibility for our work, for our code. But as I went from conference to conference, I got one question over and over and over again. But what about open source? And I think it's a really good question. If the summary of engineering ethics is to take responsibility for your work, what does it mean to utilize a bunch of code that you didn't write? Where is your responsibility in that? And to help answer this, I'm going to talk first about the responsibilities I had when I was using proprietary software as a licensed civil engineer. So it probably isn't surprising, but modern civil engineering, it's not typically done with slide rules and a ton of hand calculations. We use software, and we generally paid an exorbitant amount for it. This software, though, it was a black box. Generally speaking, you can't inspect or modify the source code, and you kind of had to approach it as trust but verify, if that makes sense. I had to carefully provide inputs to the program. Then I had to interpret the output that the software provided and do a sanity check. I would ask, does this adhere to the governing structural code? Is it constructible? So in the end, what was my responsibility? Well, my responsibility were, was for the final structural drawings and that they conform to the governing building codes and to the standard pr professional practice. Regardless of the tools that I used, I was responsible for the finished product, namely my structural drawings. So let's look at the finished product for a software developer. To do that, let's talk about what code is in production. The code you have in production is represented by this blue circle. It includes all the code that you wrote and all of your open source dependencies. But how much of that code is code that you wrote? The code that you wrote might be represented by this much smaller circle within the big blue circle representing all the code in production. But I'm actually being fairly generous here Depending on your application and what open source projects you're using, things could look really different. It could look a lot like this, or even this. Of course, these ratios may change a bit if you compare the code that's actually called, etc. but in a general way, it's really important to understand that the code you write and the code you deploy are very different things, and that they're both part of the final product. My hotel near Disneyland didn't actually incorporate the proprietary software that I used. The software was only a tool to help me with my calculations. But that's not the case for most developers who are using open source software. Open source is part of production. 
It's inherently part of the product. So if we want to take responsibility for our code, I think it makes a lot of sense to be concerned with the health and security and sustainability of uh, this, this big blue circle, right? So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we can do to help maintain those things. Let's see. So if we don't want to... If we want to take responsibility for our code, why are we using open source in the first place? So I might be preaching to the choir, but stick with me. First, we use open source because we don't want to reinvent the wheel. And we definitely don't want to spend money reinventing the wheel. We wouldn't be profitable or competitive if we keep doing the same thing repeatedly, and we'd probably be pretty bored. Additionally, there are other what I some people might call softer benefits to open source software, um, but I think that they can sometimes be the most valuable benefits. This conference, the Python community in general, they were born of open source. We learn from one another, we collaborate with each other in ways that cross lines of where we're employed, where we live, etc. And I think this kind of work can produce really interesting solutions. But there are inherent challenges that come with the use of open source software. These challenges are related to how it's created, stored, and maintained. And I specifically, call these, I specifically don't call these things problems. But they're things that we should be aware of when attempting to use open source in an ethical way. Maybe think of them as obstacles that we need to understand in order to properly navigate the open source environment. Like this awesome dog traversing an obstacle course. We need to understand the obstacles in order, and how to clear them in order to succeed. The first challenge that comes to mind is that open source software is largely built by volunteers. And don't get me wrong, volunteers are amazing. But the thing is, we're not entitled to anything from them. If you start to feel like you are, you need to take a big step back and reconsider especially if you're on Twitter or on your email and <laughs> thinking of sending some of those thoughts to maintainers. Don't do that. But the thing about volunteering is that it's voluntary. And this means that open source projects that rely on volunteers, <coughs> just most of them, all of them, um, they can suffer problems associated with burnout, turnover, transitions of leadership, delays in addressing known issues because of the competing and 1,000% reasonable interests of day jobs and families and personal health and happiness, and more. And you see these things in your day job as well, but consider how much bigger that impact is when you're not getting paid, right? It's easier to drop that, and that makes sense. The second issue I want to mention is that transparency has pros and cons. Open source is inherently transparent. The code can be inspected. It can be read. You can go into the Django repositories and poke around there. And anyone can see open issues. Vulnerabilities are often responsibly reported. But once they're reporters, reported, if users don't quickly adopt available remediations, they leave themselves open to security threats that are known. And this graph shows an example of this. It's from a report that my team recently did on the state of open source security. The graph shows downloads per month of a vulnerable version of WebSockets. There's a newer remediated version available. But while you can see that people have taken advantage of the remediation, because we do see the downloads are trending downward, right, which is what we would want to see, ideally, no one should be installing this package, or at least at this version, right? You want them installing the remediated version. And if people are still downloading a package with a known vulnerability, even when there is an option not to, like that is an opportunity for someone who is acting maliciously. So what does this all mean for us? I'm going to address the different sets of stakeholders and hopefully offer good suggestions to make open source the best that it can be. First, I want to address maintainers. 
and start by saying thank you. Thank you so much for the work that you do. You often do not get the appreciation or support that you deserve, but it is not exaggerating to say that we wouldn't be here at PyCon without you. I have a few recommendations for you, but I think it's important to start with appreciation. My first recommendation is to carefully select and use a license. This is a benefit for both you and your users. There are lots of good options that vary in strictness, and you can definitely find one that will work for your project. Personally, I would say that anyone who has public code up on GitHub or a different uh, source control management thing, um, if you have a repo that's public, you should select a license and include it in your repository, even if you don't necessarily think that anyone's going to fork the repo or clone it or contribute. And this is something of a problem in the Python community. I had a coworker who last year looked into the types of licenses for packages on PyPI. Most used a license, which is good, but around 14%, which is indicated in blue on the screen, uh, those 14% did not have a license selected and indicated. And that's a non-trivial amount of projects, especially because if it's up on PyPI, it's meant for people to download and use, right? Um, and if your project falls into this blue wedge, uh, the first thing I would say is adopt a license. A very good practice that I've seen some open source projects adopt is to include a security.md file in your repository. This file could include information on security practices that are in place for the project and can help users make an informed choice about whether or how to use your project. And uh, this is an example where transparency can be good. You can help people make an educated choice and you can help people volunteer their resources to fill in gaps if you say, hey, I'd really like to do this, but we don't currently, things like that. Recommendation number three is to have an exit plan. All good things come to an end, and let's say you've been maintaining a project for a while and you want to step away to pursue other things. If you're a maintainer for a large project, this maybe isn't a huge worry because there's likely a community of maintainers on whom you can rely. Sometimes, though, a project may be relatively small in terms of the number of lines of code. And it might be maintained by a few or even a single person. Even so, such projects can still be used widely, right? They can still be used by a large number of people, or maybe they're used by another open source project that is used by a large number of people. So the impact can still be great. And if a person in this situation wants to step away from the project, it's a gift to the community for you to have an exit plan. Finding a person that you can turn over ownership of the project, maybe a group that uses your project as a dependency to theirs, or maybe a maintainer that's known by the community and has a similar kind of repo, um, those are great options. Uh, you can also officially retire the project. And whether you transfer ownership to a known person or if you retire it, be as transparent as possible about this process. It can make the world a difference to the people who use your project. And this has actually been an, a vector of attack in, a, in the past. This past fall, NPM had a problem with malicious code that was found in a package that had changed owners. And the new owner was a bad actor. And this is why if you're turning over ownership, it makes sense to do so to someone who is known by the community, if at all possible. Someone who already has a stake, right? And finally, I say to maintainers, make things easy, or make it easy to report security vulnerabilities. People should be able to find information on how you do this through your GitHub, GitLab, et cetera, and through any official site for your project. For example, the Python Packaging Authority does a really good job of this. You can fairly easily find this information in their GitHub although I would title it in all capitals and put it in the home directory, but still, they're doing an awesome job. 
and you can find the details on their website as well. They give clear instructions on how to responsibly report. And uh, just, as, if not just as important, if not more so, they give instructions about what not to do. And this includes things like don't open a GitHub issue. Maintainers, make it easy for others to help you in ways that will actually be helpful. Make sure people can easily find a way to responsibly report vulnerabilities. In the previously mentioned state of open source security report, my team found that more than half of maintainers, more than half of them had the experience of someone opening a public issue to report a vulnerability. You want to avoid that if at all possible. It means a greater risk to your users, and you are going to have a bunch of pressure to fix the issue now. Make it easy on yourself by making it easy for others to report a problem in a discreet manner. Next, I have some recommendations for companies that use open source software. First, contribute. As uh, Russell Keith McGee said uh, at our opening keynote, get out your wallet, right? Let developers contribute to your projects that, or to the projects that you use on company time. Financial support is very important, but I think it's great if you let people contribute on company time as well. And make sure that it's included in your metrics for evaluating employees and things like that, right? Because if it's not rewarded by your company for an employee to do so, they won't. Or at least they won't on company time, right? You need to make it beneficial for everybody, right? Um, and it really is important to support projects financially. It can make a world of difference to the people who maintain the projects that you use. Open source allows you to build amazing things. It helps you stay competitive, and you should be actively involved in supporting it with time and with financial resources, even if you're small or new. I want to add that if you have people with security expertise, I would encourage you to especially allow them to contribute on company time to an open source project that you use. Their expertise can be particularly valuable to the health and sustainability of an open source project because this is sometimes an, sometimes an area where maintainers might not feel confident and it never hurts to have a second pair of eyes, right? Some more findings from my team's state of open source security uh, report indicate that among open source maintainers, security knowledge seems to be improving, but only 30% of maintainers rate their security knowledge as high. You can see them in purple on this chart. And this is an area where companies can help. Give time to your security conscious people and allow them to contribute. Recommendation two, document and plan. Keep close track of the open source software projects that you use and their dependencies that those projects use. Build time into your roadmap for your developers to keep up to date with their project versions or refactor when a particular tool is no longer supported. This work has business value. That's why you're putting it on the roadmap. These kinds of things are not nice to haves. They're essential to a healthy project. Right? Think of it as preventative medicine. That helps. Another thing that I would add is to use available tools. These tools will help you understand your dependencies and the known vulnerabilities within them, and some of them can help you with remediation. My employer, Sneak, makes tools that does this, and we have a free tier. But there are open source options as well. PIPN, for instance, has the ability to scan for known vulnerabilities in your dependency tree, and that's really awesome. I would try that. Um, and number four is to lead by example and responsibly report vulnerabilities. Number five is to donate a bug bounty program. Do you have a bug bounty program for your projects, for your products? Uh, consider turning that around and sponsoring a bug bounty program for an open source project that you use. Bug bounty 
bug bounty programs have some pros and some cons, and it seems to be better at capturing certain kinds of vulnerabilities than others. But this is a concrete thing that you can do. It's good PR for you, it's good for your security, and it can encourage reporting and responsible reporting for the projects that you rely on, and that's just a win-win-win. All right, so these are ideas for companies, and we've talked about ideas for maintainers, but what as individuals can you do to use open source in a really positive way? First, I would say is educate yourself about open source software. All of us are going to be coming from a different starting point in our familiarity with open source and how it works. And um, so wherever you are, take the next educational step uh, to learn more about the open source software uh, ecosystem, right? GitHub has a great tool um, that will introduce you to open source. It has good recommendations for best practices, and uh, I encourage you all to check it out, especially if you're a little bit newer. Second, I would encourage you to keep track of your dependencies and do your best to keep up to date on releases. This is just good for the health and sustainability of um, any projects you may have. Third, I would say you should consider a security tool. These tools that I mentioned for companies are available to you as well. I challenge you to try using a tool on one of your repos and one of your projects and see what it finds. For instance, I have this sample project of mine from when I was first learning to code. Using Sneak, I found eight vulnerabilities, including four with high severity. Now, this isn't really deployed anywhere, so um, I don't need to remediate anything. But if it was, <laughs> then I would want to know um, where these vulnerabilities are and what I could maybe do to upgrade them and, and uh, patch them and things like that, right? Knowing is half the battle. A security tool helps you be vigilant. So let's say you're using a security tool and everything checked out. So you're good, right? Well, you need to continue to check for vulnerabilities because new vulnerabilities are found all the time. So you really need to take Mad-Eye Moody's advice here and practice constant vigilance. This isn't a one and done thing. Keep an eye, or even a mad eye, on your open source dependencies and keep up to date with new versions to the best of your ability. Recommendation four is to advocate for more deliberate use of open source software in your workplace. If you've learned something interesting today about the thoughtful and deliberate use of open source, I encourage you to share it with your coworkers. Advocate for better open source software practices in your workplace, and I think that makes you a hero. And finally, I would like to address communities. Oh no. Sorry about that. I should have some like music or something playing. So to distract you from this and it's showing up, great. So finally, I wanna address communities. I encourage communities to create space for, open, for discussion on open source and to brainstorm ways that we can improve how we contribute to it and how we use it. I wanna thank PyCon for leading by example in this area. They selected this talk, provided this space. Uh, they they want to keep this issue going, right? Uh, and this jives really nicely with the things that um, Russell Keith McGee was saying at our opening keynote, right? Um, we're in this together, so we should talk about these things. I want to encourage all of you to continue conversation about open source over a meal or in the hallways. And I encourage your communities to have these kinds of conversations as well. And I encourage you also to take this second recommendation to challenge one another. Respectfully challenge one another. Make your study group, maybe your study group could have an upgrade your packages day. 
maybe host an event to fundraise in support of an open source project. Pull out your wallet and ask your friends if they've pulled out theirs. Challenge one another to step up and we can do really amazing things. Thanks so much for coming today. I really, really appreciate it. I'm gonna be posting these slides from my Twitter account listed there um, in about another hour or so. The slides include links to relevant resources and more. And uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. And while you're at it, thank a maintainer. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Haley. Um, we will not be taking questions for this presentation. If you'd like to find Haley out in the hall, you're more than welcome to. And thank you very much.